Hello, my name is Ariel Wolchfort. I'm the director of the Shalhevet Steinsalz Learning Community, and I'm thrilled to be your host for this very special event. We want to welcome all friends, supporters, partners, and students of Rav Steinsalz from around the globe, wherever you may be, and we thank you for joining us for the third year site of Adin Evan Israel Steinsalz. In order to explain our theme, I want to share a story about an engineer and researcher named Peter Skillman. Peter conducted a challenge, a research through a challenge called the Spaghetti Challenge, where he gave out to groups 20 pieces of spaghetti, 20 straws of spaghetti, a yard of scotch tape, and some marshmallows. Task is simple, to create the team with the tallest tower, using the tape and the marshmallows to connect the tallest tower is the winning team. He took teams of uh, CEOs, MBA students, lawyers, and he also took teams of kindergarten students, kindergartens, little children. And uh, he, he did, did this several times, and it turned out that the most successful group, surprisingly, was the little children. The little children, the kindergartners, had the tallest towers, by, statistically speaking, by a large margin. I was wondering, why? Why do the little children have taller towers than other groups? And interestingly enough, the main word would be safety. Meaning that when adults enter a challenge like this, a group challenge like this, they come in with certain rules, whether it be hierarchy, their self-image, what is this person going to say, what am I going to say? They sit down, they make a plan, perhaps they disagree, they change their plans a little bit. Whereas when the children go into this, they don't, they don't have those dynamics. They go in with a certain sense of social safety, they walk into it and they just enjoy building the tower together. And that creates better results, just that dynamic. I believe that it was so important for Rav Steinsaltz to create a similar climate within the realm of Torah study, uh, where every Jew, wherever background, wherever they may be from, feels that sense of safety and, uh, and beyond that academic hierarchy to be able to sound and, and make their voice, unique voice, heard. And, um, and we're going to try to uh, celebrate that and celebrate that idea and put an emphasis on that. Uh, this evening, we're going to start off with a uh, special, unique march nigun from our wonderful band, all students of Rav Steinsaltz, and followed by some words of inspiration by uh, Rabbi Steinsaltz. L'chaim, l'chaim, wherever you are. L'chaim, l'chaim. Thank you. 
claps at home for us. L'chaim, L'chaim, a wonderful band. I'm very excited to present... I'm excited to present our keynote speaker, Rabbi Simon Jacobson. Rabbi Jacobson is a pioneering speaker, educator, and mentor to thousands. He is the author of the best-selling book, To Word a Meaningful Life, that has sold over 400,000 copies and has been translated into several languages. For over 14 years, Rabbi Jacobson, as editor-in-chief of Vada Nuchas Mimim, was responsible for publishing the talks of the late Rabbi Menachem Mendel Schneerson, the Lubavitch Rebbe. Rabbi Jacobson heads the Meaningful Life Center, called a spiritual Starbucks by the New York Times, which bridges the secular and the spiritual through a wide variety of live and online programming, presenting the universal teachings of Torah as a blueprint for life to people of all backgrounds. With pleasure, Rabbi Jacobson. One of the greatest mysteries in history is the secret of Jewish survival. How did a fledgling nation under severe oppression, not just thousands of years ago, but through the millennia, how do they not just survive, but thrive? When all other empires, literally everyone, the Egyptian, the Assyrian, the Babylonian, the Greek, the Persian, the Roman, the Spanish empire, and many more are literally gone. How did they make it? How did the Jews flourish and grow? And today still a minority dominate headlines and continue to be such a powerful presence and influence in this world. My friends, the secret lies in three things. The Torah, students, and love. When Moshe Rabbeinu, Moses came down from Mount Sinai, he brought with him the Torah, a document, a mandate, a divine mandate from God, a blueprint for life, tremendous scholarship, all included in that Torah, the written Torah, the oral Torah, as it would be developed through the years that followed. But it wasn't just a book. It wasn't just a body of literature. Students, Moshe Rabbeinu had students. He taught. He taught these students. So you can have a book, you can have many books, but if you don't have students, who's living it? Who's teaching it? Who's breathing it? And then love, all saturated with Rabbi Akiva, what Rabbi Akiva called the Klal Gadol Beteira, the fundamental principle, foundation, and cornerstone of all of Judaism, all of Torah. Love your fellow like yourself. You take three, three ingredients and bring them together and you have the secret to eternity. The Torah, of course, is the blueprint, is the teachings is the guidebook, a roadmap for life. Without that, you don't have a centerpiece. You don't have a hub. The Torah provides a framework, an infrastructure that guides us in every area of life, both on the halachic level, law, the philosophical level, the spiritual level. Pshat remez drusad, pardes, the literal the allegorical, the Talmudic, the homiletic, and the mystical, with all its dimensions, the written, the oral, the Talmud, the Mishnah, the Gemara, the Zohar, the Medrashim, and through all the generations, a body of work that is still not fully appreciated, that lays out a comprehensive framework for life, every aspect of life, from litigation to damages to how to live a spiritual life, how to live a transcendent life. That, of course, is the centerpiece. But a Torah without a community, without people, without students, remains a book, remains abstract. It is the students that bring, bring it alive. 
So it's an education system that's passed on ish mipi ish, a masora, a chain that's passed on from Moshe, like we say in the Pirkei Avot, in the ethics of the fathers, Moshe Kibbal Torah Messinai. Moshe received the Torah from Sinai, or Masara Yeshua. He gave it to Joshua. And Joshua Yeshua Liskenim to the sages. And Skenim Linevim. And he continues on through the generations, passing on teacher to student, teacher to student, word of mouth. Well, what are they passing on? The teachings. So you have the teachings and now living and developing through different students, and all saturated, and all with the undercurrent of love, which also emphasizes a critical component here. When you have a book, and without students, without a vibrant living Torah, it can be quite static. But human beings give it life and also give it diversity. Because ain't dare say in Shavas. No two people think alike. And part of the Torah is that dynamic of dialogue, of debate, of argument and counter-argument. Shammai and Hillel, Rav and Shmuel, the Chachamim and Rab Meir, and even in the time of Meish Rabbeinu. It was critical that there be discussion because that diversity adds a dimension that can only come from different approaches, stretching an idea in every possible direction. And when you have the love, love does not mean everyone is a clone and we're all the same. Love means harmony within diversity. And that's, in brief, the secret. When you combine those elements, you have something that's indestructible. Then Torah is there, the integrity of the Torah, the students. Give it that life and the love. Make sure that it remains within a framework, a structure that the diversity does not lead to, God forbid, div divisiveness but leads to harmony, a greater harmony. Beauty is always a combination of many different colors or musical notes creating a greater tapestry, symphony. We're gathered here to honor the third yard site of Rav Adin Steinsaltz. And I want to thank the Shalheves Learning Community, the Steinsaltz Yeshiva, Steinsaltz Center, Beth, Beth Tfila, and all those that make this event possible. And Rav Adin personified and captured all these three elements. Torah giant, look at the books that he authored, the different projects, many still are being developed. The Torah, students established a yeshiva, number of yeshivas, many students. So it's not just the man, his students carry on the legacy, continue the teaching, the approach, and all saturated with a profound love. When you look at the diversity of the different people Rabbi Din inspired, educated. That diversity tells you much. And one of the challenges in our time is there may be great scholars and there may be great pious people, but they don't often get along with each other. You want to be Malamed's chus, find merit? Yes, because people have strengths and sometimes difficult for them to understand and appreciate another strength. But the greatest strength of all of MS is when you see diversity. When you have several students of different types and different mindsets and different ways of looking at things, different perspectives, and yet they're able to communicate and create a synergy that's more than the sum of the parts. That carries the truth of Torah. Where you have Torah and the students, the diversity and the love, that's the glue that connects them all. Therefore, it should be no surprise that the birthday of Rabbi Adin, the beginning of Av, in the nine days, and his yard site in the second half of Av, after the 15th of Av, are all in this month of Av, which is a month of paradox. 
On one hand, we know this is the saddest month in the Jewish calendar, marked by Tisha B'Av, the ninth of Av, the day when the Talmud, the Mishnah tells us the five tragic events that happened. Of course, perhaps the most prominent, the destruction of the first and second temples, with the second temple being destroyed because of sinas chinam, baseless hatred and divisiveness. But at the same time, we're told that on the day of Tisha B'Av, the ninth of Av, Mashiach is born. That's why we say Nachim in the afternoon service. And then the month continues as the moon begins to wax and grow to the 15th of the month. And what do we learn in the end of Masech the Tainis? About the 15th of Av, the full moon, the Loi Hoi Yom Tevim Yisrael, there were no holidays in Israel. Like the 15th of Av and Yom Kippur. Equating the 15th of Av to Yom Kippur. And the Mishnah Talmud goes on to explain the different reasons for it. Different events, all connected to what? To unity. The antithesis, the exact opposite of the disunity that destroyed the temple. Comes the Ariza, and he explains what lies behind all these reasons. It's the full moon. That after the desecration and the violation of Malchus, the language of Kabbalah, of the moon, on the ninth of Av, the 15th of Av is the greatest holiday. More than the 15th of all other months, including Passover and Sukkot and Purim, because it comes after such a great descent, now comes a great ascent. And it leads to Yom Kippur, because Yom Kippur is what? Is the repair, the atonement, the forgiveness granted to Moses, to the Jewish people, after the, des- after the great sin of the golden calf. So from the darkness comes the greatest light. And indeed, what happens after on Tu B'Av, on the 15th of Av, on the 15th of Av, the, the Talmud tells us, that's when the night begins to get longer in, in Israel, in Eretz Yisrael. And the day is shorter, and the night is created for what? The night is created in order to study Torah. So we begin to increase in study of Torah. So there you have, on one half, the beginning of Av is the Saturday time. And then the Tikkun, the repair, comes in the second half. And when is the yard site of Rabadin, the 17th of Av, following right after the 15th of Av, the increase in Torah, the increase in love, in Achdus, in unity, and the increase of perpetuating Torah through students. We're told that on the day of a yard site, the neshama of that person, all the work he did, gathers together, accumulates, and elevates to the highest states, but also comes downward and brings us Pale Yeshua's Bekerev Aretz, brings us redemption, salvations, even in the depths of the abyss of this world. So it's not just another day, it's a day that captures all the work that Rabbi Din did and continues to perpetuate through us. So the power of these three items, of these three, I'd say, foundations, Torah, students, and love, is something that we need to embrace because everything has to come down to a call to action. A call to action in our lives. We see today, unfortunately, you see not just diversity, you see divisiveness. Especially in our holy land recently. What's the solution? Everybody's wondering. When people fundamentally disagree. The solution is Toyota, students, and Av is Israel. Diversity is fine. It's fine to have disagreements. But they don't have to be personalized. We have to be able to love each other. What lay at the heart of, of Adin, anyone who knew him? Like his, his name implies, Adin, sweetness, charm, love. 
the classic story everybody knows, Rabbi Din was once talking to someone who, when he was giving his classes and invited him to come to his class, this person insisted that he's a radical atheist and doesn't keep Shabbos. And Vadin, in a sweet way, said to him, Why, what, how, what, in what way do you not keep Shabbos? He says, on Shabbos, of all days of the week, that's when I eat that which is forbidden, pork. Only on Shabbos? Yeah, that's what I do on Shabbos, to emphasize and to illustrate and demonstrate my rejection of it all. So he says, so we're the same. We both keep Shabbos. I keep Shabbos in one way, you keep it another way. In this disarming fashion, not personalizing. Other people may start yelling and screaming at the fellow or definitely ignoring him. Recognizing that a Nisham is always alive. I may be asleep, but my heart is awake. The pilot flame of a Nisham is always there. Rav Adin personified that as well. And it came from his knowledge, not just in prodigial knowledge in Talmud, but also his knowledge of Chassidus. Chapter 32 in Tanya, talking about the love that each of us have because we're all part of one family. So you have people who have a lot of love. There are people who have a lot of scholarship. The challenge is to bring them together and to produce the students the diverse students, to have both. Because some people may argue, once you have the standard of Torah, how could you really love everyone unconditionally? What about people who are not Torah people? Or for whatever reason, Tinuk Shanishba, they are in a state where they're ignorant or they were born into captivity, unaware of what their Jewish heritage is all about. But then we remember the mission of Pirkei Ovis. Have a mitamid of shal Aaron, be from the students of Aaron. And when is Aaron's Yartzeit and Rishchidoshav. And the Rishchidoshav of Magdim Rafu Lamaka, right when the nine days begin. And what does it say? Mitamid of Shalarn. Oyev Shalom, Vareid of Shalom. Love peace and pursue it. And peace means much more than just the absence of war. Shalom means complete wholesomeness. And he says, Oyev Sabriya, so Makarvon Lutaira. Love the creatures. Why the creatures? So he explains in the Tanya, Tanya chapter 32 that even if the person to your eye does not seem to have any other quality but the mere fact that he's a creature of God, just by that alone, even though it's hard to imagine someone should have any, qual- any other qualities, but that alone is worth, he's worthy of love. What created B'Tselem Elikim in the divine image. And then, Umakarvan Leteira. Don't bring the Teira to him. Umakarvan. Bring him. Or her closer to Torah. Again, Torah and love. But it begins with the love. And it's a love extended to each one of us. So here in the month of Av, birthday in Yotzeit of Rabadin, we honor and celebrate and more importantly commit to making sure to perpetuate Mechayel al-Chayel, Mailam B'Kedesh, from strength to strength and always growing perpetuation of Torah that speaks to every individual. The producing of students, making sure it's perpetuated through students, not just remains a book without legs and arms and mouthpiece and mind and heart that makes it living in the vibrant structure of teacher-student, student-student, and all filled with Avas Yisrael, V'haftarecha kamaycha which, in direct contrast to that which destroyed the temple, that was destroyed and severed the connection between heaven and earth, between the divine and existence, our love, Barcheinu avinu kolonu ke'echad. God blesses us when we are one, when a father sees his children. As diverse as they may be, all joining together, there's no greater nachas and no greater joy. So may the neshama of Rabbi Din and all the great people perpetuating his work, continue to penetrate and to reach and influence everyone we can. Thank you for the honor to share a few words on this this important event and may it bring into real action 
that which continues to perpetuate the eternal flame of Am Yisrael Chai. Netzach Yisrael, forever and ever, as we march to the Gula Mitis Vashlema, and should it be, may it be, should it be, in this month of Av, even before we get to Elul. Thank you so much. Baruchim to you, may you be blessed. All in good health. And as I said, we should march into the Gula, Mitis Vashlema. Call to thank you.
L'chaim, l'chaim. We will now transition to the second part of our event, something that was so dear to Rav Steinsaltz, learning Torah together. I'm happy to introduce four of Rav Steinsaltz's very close students as we join them in learning a piece of the Talmud that addresses our theme. There is no aspect of Judaism that presents this concept of seeking wisdom through diversity more than our Talmud. The Talmud is rich in endless discussions, disagreements, and disputes in the goal of seeking and exploring God's wisdom. We're excited to learn the source from the brand new portal of the Steinzelt Center. We welcome you all to enjoy the many resources from the portal and the link we have attached. Joining us today in our learning session are Rabbi Menachem Evan Israel, son of Rav Steinzelt. Rabbi Evan Israel is the CEO of the Steinzelt Center, which serves as the umbrella organization for all Steinzelt's functions. The Steinzelt Center continues to be fully active with many new learning initiatives, including the Steinzelt's library portal. Mr. Arthur Kurzweil, a student of Rav Steinzelt's for many years, Arthur is an author, educator, editor, writer, publisher, and illusionist, and we are happy to have him with us. Rabbi Pini Alush, Rabbi Alush, a longtime student of Rav Steinzaltz, is the rabbi and founder of the Beth Tefillah Synagogue in Scottsdale, Arizona, and the founder of the Nishmat Adin High School in Arizona. Rabbi Michal Falk, Rabbi Falk is Rosh Yeshiva of the Steinzaltz Yeshiva and will be guiding us in this learning session. Finally, at the end of the session, we have the privilege and the honor to sum it all up with words about the same topic from Rav Steinzaltz himself in a wonderful video. Rabbi Falk, please. I'll start with the L'chaim. Thank you for all of you guys joining us, dear friends from around the world. L'chaim. The Neshobe Zohobin Aliyah, the soul of Rabbi Steinzaltz, that was so dear to all of us, he should have that uplifting together with all of us and through our learning now together from his, from his Talmud and from so many other books. L'chaim. The the piece of Talmud that we chose over here relates to Rabbi Yochanan and Reish Lakish. Rabbi Yochanan and Reish Lakish both were great sages at the beginning of the Jerusalem Talmud. The truth is that Rabbi Yochanan, he was probably the scholar, the Talmudic scholar, that thanks to Rabbi Yochanan, the Jerusalem Talmud exists. Now Rabbi Yochanan was so central in the Jerusalem Talmud that Rabbi Yochanan is mentioned so many times also in the Babylonian Talmud. The relationship between Rabbi Yochanan and Reish Lakish, who also happened to be later on his brother-in-law, was a very interesting, complex relationship which started from Rabbi Yochanan, who was a great scholar, and Reish Lakish, who was probably the opposite. He was busy getting into trouble as a thief, or as they call it, melastem et abriot in Hebrew. Rabbi Yochanan, who met Reish Lakish, in one of those exciting moments, tells him, your strength is so amazing, you can use that strength for Torah, for studying. He invites him to devote his strength for the Jewish nation and for the Torah. And at that moment, Reish Lakish, after a very interesting negotiation they have between the two of them, which ends up, Rabbi Yochanan offers him his beautiful sister, they become a chavruta. They become partners learning Torah together. And this is what we want to talk about over here and learn together with Rabbi Kurzweil, with Rabbi Alush, with Rabbi Meni Evan Israel. I will 
quickly go through this short piece of Talmud and then ask from you three to give your own insights, own comments, and I hope that you don't agree. And I hope we'll see here an interesting argument between the three, three of you. So I will start from the Steinsaltz edition that you all can see on the Zoom attached. And of course, afterwards, you could go into the link that was attached and enjoy the portel that has the full piece of Talmud and many, many other special, precious books of the rabbi. Nach nafshe de Rabbi Shimon ben Lakish. Reish Lakish, Rabbi Shimon, the son of Lakish, died. Rabbi Yochanan, who was his very, very close chavruta, partner in learning, was sorely pained over losing him. The rabbi said, who will go to calm Rabbi Yochanan's mind and comfort him over his loss? The rabbis come up with a great idea. Nezil Rabbi Elazar ben Pedat de Mechadedin Shmatete. Rabbi Elazar ben Pedat was a very close student of Rabbi Yochanan and a tremendous scholar of his own. He is not the subject of this specific piece of Talmud, but there are many pieces of Talmud that talk about Rabbi Elazar. They thought Rabbi Elazar will be the perfect match to study and comfort Rabbi Yochanan. How do you comfort Rabbi Yochanan? Through being his chavruta, learning together with Rabbi Yochanan. Azal Yativ Kameh. Rabbi Lazar, that great sage, went and sat before Rabbi Yochanan. Kol mil tadav amar Rabbi Yochanan, amar leitanya de Messiah Rabbi Yochanan, with regard to every matter that Rabbi Yochanan would say, Rabbi Lazar ben Pedat would say to him, there's a ruling which is taught in a Beraita, a previous, from the time of the Mishnah that supports your opinion. What was Rabbi Yochanan's reaction? One might think that Rabbi Yochanan was overjoyed. He was so happy to hear from Rabbi Lazar ben Pedat that those from the Mishnah, the sages before him, said the same. Rabbi Yochanan said to him, Are you comparable to the son of Lakish, Reish Lakish? In my discussions with the son of Lakish, when I would state a matter, he would raise 24 difficulties against me. He would argue with him. He would try to disprove my claim. And I would answer him with 24 answers. And now listen to what says Rabbi Yochanan. And the halacha by itself would become broadened and clarified. And you say to me, there's a ruling which is taught in a brighta that supports your opinion. Do I not know that what I say is good? Rabbi Yochanan wasn't comforted at all by his new chavruta. He was looking for Reish Lakish. He was looking for a partner that would argue with him, that would challenge him. And this is how the story ends. Please, Reb Kurzweil, my dear friend Arthur, I miss you dearly. I hope we get to sit and study together, not on Zoom, very soon. Please share with us your thoughts on this beautiful piece of Talmud. Um, one of the pieces of the, the passage from the Talmud that, that you, you may have left out that has some relevance here is that Rabbi Yochanan reminded Reish Lakish that he used to be a crook. He used to, he used to be a thief. 
And uh, British Lachish was insulted, seemingly insulted. It reminded me of an incident that happened to me when I was about 45 years ago. Um, I, I was introduced to the Talmud by a teacher. We studied once a week. And at one point, he suggested that I buy a set of the Sonsino Talmud, which at the time was the only English language Talmud that we had. So I bought the set of, uh, of books, and the teacher said to me, why don't you get some of your friends together? And to inaugurate the book, you could, you could uh, teach a little bit of, uh, from the Talmud. So I invited some friends over, and uh, I opened it to a page that I had planned to speak about, and I spoke about it, and I, I dare say it was pretty good, what I said. At which point the Talmud teacher looked at me and said, Kurzweil, I remember when you, you used to eat bacon cheeseburgers. So I've been thinking about that for the last 45 years. I've thought about other things too, but uh, I've thought about for the last 45 years, was that a, was that a compliment or was that an insult? Uh, originally, I took it as an insult. You're, you're, um, you're reminding me of a past that I'm not so eager to remember. I've been, I've been born again. On the other hand, it could have been a compliment. Uh, Kurzweil, look how far you've come. It isn't, isn't it wonderful? <clears throat> so Rabbi Yochanan said to uh, Reish Lakish, um, uh, you, you know about this, uh, how to finish off a sword, because you used to be a, a, a bandit, you used to be a crook. Now, um, the, the issue is that why are you reminding me of my past? So I've been wondering about insults and insults in the Talmud. In fact, I found a book called Talmudic Insults and Curses. And this is the expanded edition. So they, they found some more. Um, I learned that the rabbis were uh, not squeamish about uh, life. They weren't squeamish about insulting their, their colleagues and their students. I, I just want to rattle off a few of the things that they said. They said that Rabbi Abba Bar Barchana is as stupid as a donkey. Um, Rabbi Yochanan said to a student of his, you're an empty-headed person. Somebody called Rabbi Abahu a demented bird. Rabbi said to his colleagues should, uh, that they should have their tongues cut out. Rabbi said that, that Levi had no brains in his head. Some students called their teacher a reed cutter, a reed cutter in the swamp. Rabbi Nachman said to a colleague of his, he must be playing board games and neglecting his studies. Rabbi, Rav Chia, and Abaye all said the same thing to a colleague once, at least once. He said, you idiot. Um, Ula said to uh, Rav Luna um, that he was as disagreeable as vinegar on the teeth and smoke in his eyes. Rabbi Khalina said to his colleagues, may God save us from your illog illogical understanding. Shmuel said to Karma, Karna, may a horn grow out of your eyes. Shmuel said to Rabbi Elazar, you should be fed animal fodder. Rav Sheshet said to a colleague, may you be stung by a scorpion. And Shmuel said to Rav Chama, your brain is disconnected. So this book goes on to talk about lots of other curses and, and insults. Uh, and it, it makes me feel that you have to be tough when you're studying. That these weren't really insults that these great sages said to each other. They were just uh, euphemisms. They were expressions uh, for, for, for objections or whatever. Uh, I know that Rabbi Seinzaltz used to complain to me that I wasn't tough enough, that I was too delicate. And obviously, uh, I wouldn't fit into to, uh, this group of sages who seem to be very uh, relaxed about, about giving these insults to people. So my contribution today is uh, not so much a conclusion as much as it is a question. And the question is, to what extent do we use these, this kind of language 
And what, what, what does it mean? I just want to say one more thing. Rabbi Steinzel once said to me that there is a passage in the Talmud that is similar to the Zen koan, you know the sound of two hands clapping, but what is the sound of one hand clapping? It's a famous Zen koan, Zen riddle. So the, the Jerusalem Talmud says Rabbi Yochanan, wanting to make a point, began to wave his hands as though he was trying to clap with only one hand. Someone said to him, and can one clap with only one hand? And Rabbi Yochanan said, certainly not. I alone, without Resh Lakish, cannot say words of Torah. I'm eager to hear from my colleagues. Thank you so much. Thank yes. you. L'chaim. 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 We will soon see what a close student you have been, Arthur. Uh, we actually, in the yeshiva, on the computer, have a beautiful picture of the two of you, Arthur and Rabbi Steinzalt, studying together Talmud. Um, thank you so much. After your words, Arthur, please, Rabbi Many, you have a big challenge now after, uh, basically, probably Arthur said all you wanted to say. What do you want to add? Or maybe argue. Good evening. First of all, thank you all for coming and joining us in this marvelous evening. Thank you, Robert Falk and team for creating this opportunity. So, first of all, first of all, foremost, the first time I learned this tomorrow with my father, I think it was 12, maybe 13. And this is one of this kind of Gemara, this kind of piece of Talmud that by definition, one should not be learning ever. This entire page is a terrible page. From beginning to end, from the from the, the claim that certain kids or certain rabbis are not their own kids, to the, the enormous values that they have, and going down the hill from that uh, notion. At the end of this Talmud, what bothers me the most, with the respect, the amount of cursing and uh, insulting that rabbis were very common or treating each other because they were friendly. They were not insulting people because they were enemies. They were insulting people because they were friendly. Besides that, one of the things that really has a clutch there, something that bothers me tremendously, is that the reason Rish Lakish died is because Rabbi Yochan literally killed him. In one way or another, it seems from the text, if you read the text apparently, or more, you read it properly with the commentary attached, it seems that Rabbi Yochanan had the opportunity not once, not twice, three times, thrice, to stop the death of Rabbi Yochanan, of Rishlach. Remember, I came to ask my father this. And we had this conversation, and I asked him about it, and he said, you're reading it differently. The way you should read it is, that Rabbi Yochanan had to move on. The Shlokish was no longer, even though Rabbi Yochanan is, is mourning for him, the Shlokish is no longer the ultimate Chavruta. Rabbi Yochanan said to the Shlokish, I did whatever I can do for you. I brought you to faith. I brought you back from being a, a thief, a goon, cap of the two teeth of the mad local mafia, I brought you in to become under the wings of the Holy One. This is what I can do for you. That is something that I found in my father's life that is tremendously odd. My father, in his youth, he was 16, early 20s, maybe beginning of the 30s, had chavrusim, had people we actually learned with who were his teachers, his masters, people that he looked up to, Rabbi Sasanki, Rabbi Kesselman, Rabbi Eliezer, and others. In a certain point of time, which is a bit coinciding with the creation of the Talmud, first volume, first edition, my father stopped learning with people as an equal. In a way, he already understood that he has a different mission. Yet have, he has a different role in life that not everybody 
will enjoy or appreciate. He moved his alliance, he moved his thought process, so to speak, in a subrutal level to, in a lot of ways, to the Lubavitcher Rebbe. Is the point there that that is the person who guides them? Some directly, some not directly, but that's the person. I think that the yearning of Rabbi Yochanan to have someone he can talk with, somebody that he can relate to, is the desire and the hope of every great man. Rabbi Yochanan is claiming he's not he's not getting upset or getting consoled by the suggestion of the rabbis to try to find a guy who will be replacing Rabbi Yochanan. Rabbi Yochanan is saying to himself, I cannot find solace. I cannot find peace and tranquility because my level of where I was with Rish Lakish can never be attained. The fact is that I miss my father very much. The fact is that he's not with us physically. The fact is that a lot of us who had opportunity to learn with him, who study under him, miss him. The challenge for us is to move forward. Challenge for us is to find the right method to bring his words and not just keep them on the shelf or now online, but really keep them moving ahead with them. There are basic three things to how to do it. One is a person has to learn by himself. He cannot keep the book or the website closed. Person has to learn. Two, a person has to teach. Person has to get out of his way and find opportunity to teach other people. That's part of what we see from Rabbi Yochanan. The conversation between Rabbi Yochanan and Rish Lakish created a learning opportunity, a learning vision, a learning concept. Also Rabbi Yochanan himself, even though he was the master, when Rish Lakish was the student, by learning together, he increased his own learning, he increased his own knowledge. And by that, he moved forward. That's a challenge. Take the materials from Rabbi Steinbeltz on the plethora that we have of them, take them, learn them, teach them. The most important thing, and I think that is what was meant to do with all these tremendous work. My father tried to create a teacher's teacher on everybody's platform. That was the main purpose of doing the Talmud. That was the main purpose of doing the Bible. The idea is to bring it forward. How one does it, that's really up to you. I have my mission. My father was very clear to me what was my mission. And I will keep doing it all. Our goal is to find this way. How word is that even if somebody come and tell you, I have somebody who's almost as good, as clear, as a luminary is Rabbi Steinberg. You have to look at him like Rabbi Yohan looked at the new replacement with Lakish. Say it's good, but I can do better. So that hope of moving forward constantly and making my father the rabbi message alive and kicking, sometimes insulting. L'chaim, l'chaim. L'chaim. Thank you, Rabbi Meni. L'chaim. Rabbi Alush, please add your own insights on this piece of Talmud. Rabbi Yochanan, Reish Lakish, please join us. Well, it's a pleasure being here. And Shakoach, Rabbi Michal, Rabbi Ariel, and everyone involved for putting this together. As uh, someone who was born in France, I have to also commend you for the upgrade on the Lechaim. I see you saying Lechaim on wine instead of some cheap vodka. Shakoach. <laughs> L'chaim, l'chaim. L'chaim, l'chaim. As uh, Arthur did also, I do want to relate not just to the end of that discussion in the Talmud, but also, and most importantly, to the beginning of it. And I do think that both the beginning and the end are interconnected in ways that uh, may be overlooked. But uh, the relationship between Rabbi Yochan and Rish Lakish, as that beginning of the passage says, 
is an interesting one. It's not just an interesting one because of the complexity of the relationship, but because of the way it began. How did it begin? Rabbi Yochanan was swimming in the Jordan River, right? That's that part of the Talmud, just a few verses before what you were showing. He was swimming in the Jordan River, and here comes Reish Lakish. He was uh, a chief bandit, and he jumps to the point that Rabbi Yochanan is so impressed with his jump, the strength of his jump. And then Rabbi Shlakish pursues Rabbi Yochanan because apparently he was a very handsome man. Now, I, I want to pause this for a second and ask everyone here, what would you do at that point? But John Gotti comes to you and he's pursuing you. Most people would escape. No one would, would I mean, very few people would dare even engage in a conversation with the chief bandit of the time. And if you do have to engage in a conversation, it would be a very polite one. One in which you try to, again, find favor in the eyes of the chief bandit. But instead, what does Rabbi Yochanan himself do? He says to him so blatantly, <laughs> your strength, Reish Lakish, should be channeled towards Torah. If you channel your strength towards studying Torah, you'll be a great scholar. And Reish Lakish then says, well, why would I, what am I going to get in return? Or as they put it today, what's in it for me? And Rabbi Yochanan says, you see how handsome I am? Well, I have a sister who's even more beautiful than I am. I may convince her to become your wife if you do so. Reish Lakish is convinced, and that's how he becomes his student. Now, towards the end of his life, after Reish Lakish, uh, you know, uh, sorry, towards uh, the very end of that passage, after Reish Lakish passes on, then Rabbi, Shlakish, uh, Rabbi Yochanan bemoans the fact, as we just read, right, that uh, no one is as... Uh, questioning as Reish Lakish was, and apparently he also uh, is unconsolable. What's the connection between the end and the beginning? The connection is that Rabbi Yochanan was a man who, like Rabbi Steinzeltz, did not see bodies. He saw souls. He did not see chief bandits. He saw their infinite potential. And he immediately, without hesitance, even though he was speaking to a chief bandit, aims to ignite that soul, that potential. And he did so successfully. Reish Lakish could have remained the chief bandit the rest of his life, but because of Rabbi Yochanan's vision and because of his courage to ignite that soul, Reish Lakish's life was transformed and thereby his students' lives were transformed and there I say a whole generation was transformed. But that is exactly what we see towards the conclusion of that passage too. Rabbi Yochanan is bemoaning the fact that no one is questioning like Reish Lakish was questioning, because in other words, he's telling his students, why aren't you actualizing your full potential? You have so much to offer. You have so much to grow into. You have so much to challenge. You have so much to say that will make me, as your teacher, Rabbi Elchanan, grow. And yet you stay quiet. Where is that soul? That's what's shouting from those concluding verses. And again, I think that's really what Rabbi Steinzeltz taught us all. Not to just be uh, or judge a book by its cover, as they say, or to be uh, satisfied with the externalities of this world, but rather to continually dig deep and deep and deep so that we can uncover the tremendous potential and the divine soul indeed that there is in everyone and in everything. You know, I'm reminded of the words of uh, Chief Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs of Blessed Memory at Rabbi Stance's 80th birthday. If you recall his speech, I had the immense privilege of being there, and thank you for that, Rabbi Manny. But um, one of the things Rabbi Sachs shared about Rabbi Steinzeltz is that he had asked him after the fall of the Iron Curtain in 1991, if there is one book that Rabbi Steinzeltz would recommend that all Soviet Jews should read. And Rabbi Steinzeltz immediately said, yes, I think they should all be reading The Ugly Duckling by uh, Chris Anderson, some Danish poet and author. And Jonathan Sachs was, was taken aback. What, what do you mean? You're not even suggesting a Jewish book. And uh, Rabbi Steinzeltz explained, well, this is a story about an uh, uh, egg that was hatched. And this uh, new bird now finds himself among ducks. But he's really a swan. And the ducks that he was, the family of ducks that he was born into, judge him. He's ugly. They can't recognize a duck in him. Now, this person, this duck, this swan, sorry, 
believes that he's indeed a duck because that's what people have telling him. They've told him his whole life. And to make a very long story short, at one point, this ugly duckling finally realizes that he's not a duck, that he's a swan, and that he has wings with which he can fly. And this was the point of Rabbi Steins' recommendation to tell these Soviet Jews, you may have been now completely paralyzed by the Soviet Union. Communism may have stifled your growth, but remember, you're a swan. You have wings with which to fly. Your potential is infinite. I remember being with Rabbi Steinsaltz in so many, so many different uh, circumstances in which Rabbi Steinsaltz repeated that point time and time again, right here in Scottsdale, Arizona. He told someone in our community, hey, imagine that you are flying a plane and then all of a sudden you fall asleep and the plane will crash. Well, God gave you a plane to fly. Why are you falling asleep? In another instance, and I can go on and on. I know uh, you told me to speak for only three and four minutes, uh, Rabbi Michal. Uh, but, uh, you know, Rabbi Kurzweil and uh, Rabbi Manny and Rabbi Michal spoke for a few more. So I'm going to borrow some L'chaim, of L'chaim, Rabbi Alush. But in another instance, I was going to say, I remember Rabbi Steinzels telling me that he believes that every Jew should have two bodyguards. Every Jew should have two bodyguards walking with him everywhere. I said, why? He said, well, one bodyguard to make sure that they don't trample and destroy everything. That's number one. Number two, so that they can remind them and whisper in their ears that they were born to be great. And that's really what Rabbi Steinzelt saw in people, so in, in things altogether. That, I think, had become his, really his, his, his life calling, his life mission to turn what uh, others may define as mediocre into what they really were, which means great things. And that's what he wanted to make of each and every one of us. We can't just settle for less. There's so much more or in his own words. The sky that is above our head today should become the ground on which we tread on tomorrow. Every single day we must grow and grow and do more and do more. And there is never a time in which we can just say that we've arrived. So I think that as we gather here, it would behoove everybody, every single one of us, including myself, to ask ourselves, how can we actualize our infinite potential, our divine soul, even more? How can we say to ourselves, that my strength should really be channeled and, again, exercised to its full potential? How can I continue to grow more and more as Rabbi Steinsaltz would want me to? If we can answer that question, I think we will be able to say what the Talmud says, Mazaro b'chaim, afu b'chaim. Just as we are alive with his legacy, the legacy of, of unstoppable growth, so too Rabbi Steinsaltz continues to be alive in us, with us, and through us, and through our actions. L'chaim, l'chaim, l'chaim. L'chaim, Rabbi Alush, thank you so much. We now have a uh, very special surprise. Rabbi Steinsaltz actually related exactly to this uh, very special relationship between Rabbi Yochanan and Reish Lakish in a very short video that we all will watch right now. L'chaim. You can have people doing, doing things. You can have a certain amount of call and a certain amount of disagreement. Disagreement is not the day, it's not the end of the world. Disagreement can be the beginning of the world. Disagreement can be can bring new understanding. And sometimes sometimes the the the, the, the role of a question of a query of a of a of a contesting point is as important as a supporting point. See, you have, it's a, it's a, it's a wonderful, uh, almost, uh, it's almost, it's, it sounds like a, like a Zen sentence. See, that uh, Rabbi Yohanan was, who was the great scholar and so on, he had his brother-in-law who was, they were always, always disputing. Every, every time there was, there was a dispute between them. So there, there was a time when Reish Lakish, the, the father and wife, to hide. And, and they asked the, the, the president of the place, asked, 
I still have your hand to say, how your hand tied to the a movement as if clapping hands with one hand. <laughs> so, so, so he said, I cannot do it with one hand. I need two hands. So I say, he's always asking you questions. Said, of course, he asks me a question. I answer, I give him an answer. He asks another question. I give him a better answer. So that's, that's how the Torah goes. If there are no questions, there won't be any answers. L'chaim, everybody, again. Thank you so much. I think what uh, we heard from uh, Arthur, from Rabbi Alush, from Rabbi Meni, and, of course, from Rabbi Adin, Rabbi Steinsaltz, there were very different angles on different parts of the piece of Talmud, but all were looking for that passion, that juice that is within Yiddishkeit, within Judaism. We need to grow. Judaism needs to grow and the Jewish people need to grow together. And that diversity, that seeking for knowledge, let my people know, can be the way that we all together we don't need to agree. We don't need to be yes men. As Rabbi Yochanan said to Rabbi Eleazar Pedat, and I, I really could imagine Rabbi Steinsaltz over there looking in our, into our eyes as students. And he would always tell us, I want you as students to challenge. A good student is the student that challenges his teacher. And therefore, Within our very challenging situation over here in Israel, I'm sure all of you around the world are aware of what is going on over here in Israel. And the truth is, I think that the same in many aspects is what's happening in America, in South America, in Europe. Everybody's looking for that very pleasant, comfortable, space where he can feel at home and he wants to see those yes men saying yes the Brita says just like you say we all agree but the truth is is that Rabbi Steinsaltz and the Talmud that he loved so much were so much a issue of challenging of diversity of arguing and that is the way that we can grow, that we can be excited about our Judaism, we could be excited about our truth. Because just to hear that we are always correct and that we are always right and that we are in our comfort zone, that doesn't make us grow, that, that doesn't make us bigger. Rabbi Steinsaltz would always end his classes as a young student at the age of 14. He would always tell us at the end, Okay, Rutsu, you now need to go run. He would give us the very famous medrash that there is over there, a mazal that would come and say to you, Gdal, you need to grow, you need to be bigger. And I think in many ways, that is the vision that we all can take upon ourselves by learning the Talmud, by arguing, by challenging our teachers, our students, our chavruta, and together we'll make the Jewish world and the world as a whole a better, livelier place. L'chaim. Thank you, Ariel. Thank you, our great players, musicians. L'chaim. L'chaim, l'chaim. I would like once again to thank you all for joining us, to thank specifically our Shalhevet learners, participants, the incredible and inspiring learning and connections. It's unbelievable what you've accomplished. And I would like to invite you all to join Shalhevet. Uh, learning one-on-one -on -one in Shalhevet is not only an incredible opportunity for meaningful learning and for personal connections, but a wonderful way to continue Rav Steinzelt's legacy. You can find the link in our chat. Where is the link? Where is the link? The link is in our chat.
right away. Don't wait. Rutsu, rutsu, run. Lechaim, lechaim. Sim, Sim, Sim.